Ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, good afternoon. Uh, so one of the uh, last panels uh, uh, we're going to introduce to you is a panel which uh, is bringing uh, uh, some foreign ministers who participated yesterday and, and today uh, in a parallel meeting of uh, the V4, the Visegrad group countries with the Western Balkan six where also the first Vice President of the Commission, Franz Timmermans, uh, uh, took a, uh, participated in, uh, Secretary of State of the United Kingdom, uh, representatives of Slovenia and, and Croatia uh, uh, as uh, uh, our dear uh, guests. But let me not start about talking uh, 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 or talking about this issue because we will sooner or later come to this. Let me try to rephrase the name of this panel, the, the question that it, it poses about restarting. I mean, I mean, you could hardly restart something that's going on for some time. And let me offer you a little bit different uh, uh, perspective uh, and discuss with uh, my dear friends uh, uh, Igor, the foreign uh, minister and deputy prime minister of uh, Montenegro, and Didmir, the foreign minister of, uh, of, of Albania. We should be soon uh, joined also by uh, Nicola, the foreign Minister of, uh, of Macedonia. The enlargement uh, uh, is a part of the DNA of the European Union. There are two policies, the deepening uh, uh, integration on one side and the widening the membership on the other side. This is uh, uh, what I call the DNA uh, of the European Union. Those are the two policies which do not contradict to each other. On the contrary, they actually need each other. And sometimes it's sort of the deepening, the integration, which uh, allows uh, 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 and necessitates for, uh, enlargement and sometimes the pressure uh, from that enlargement on the consequences of the enlargement which makes uh, the European Union or at least a part of the European Union uh, around the euro uh, going deeper uh, uh, in, in integration. Enlargement uh, uh, has been many years for many people, uh, uh, a business for the Commission. It appeared almost like being on autopilot. But then uh, the people started to talk uh, 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 about, about credibility. What has happened with the credibility of enlargement? Uh, some of you might remember that, uh, particularly after the last wave of enlargement, uh, uh, I'm not talking about Croatia, but uh, about the two other countries. Uh, um, the member states have adopted quite uh, unprecedented uh, uh, decisions to create uh, 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 some kind of verification mechanism to make sure that those two countries, being already a part of the European Union, uh, still continue to fulfill their home task, which has not been finished by the time they were admitted to the European Union. Uh, and if you take uh, uh, this together with uh, this uh, uh, big wave of enlargement in 2004, I think uh, you had uh, uh, quite an obvious situation for actually many people saying, ah, oh, there is an enlargement fatigue now. Uh, it was interesting. They started to talk about the enlargement fatigue when actually there were no signs of enlargement fatigue. Uh, uh, at least I have never got uh, any real proof uh, of enlargement fatigue. It was like talking about Yeti. Everyone is talking about it. No one has seen it. 
Uh, but through the back door, there was another challenge, uh, uh, which I actually thought even more dangerous, and there was a reform fatigue among the candidate and aspirant uh, uh, countries, and that was the time to make the enlargement more political. Oh, there is always more risks when you bring uh, the member states and, and giving them many more opportunities uh, uh, to veto uh, the, the process at the various stages. But there is definitely also an advantage uh, to it. Uh, the member states keeping their finger on the preparation uh, of the candidate countries, ensuring that actually there is no need for this verification, this, this, this control and verification mechanism uh, to be repeated uh, 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 was extremely, uh, extremely important. So there is no autopilot anymore as far as the enlargement. The member states are fully controlled behind, uh, uh, behind the sphere. There has been, beyond the enlargement book, a number of the new uh, ways of engagement between the, uh, between the Commission um, uh, and, uh, and the candidate countries. But then uh, uh, we thought that the economic crisis is the last one. Uh, then we thought the financial crisis is the last sort of crisis uh, uh, to face to only face another one, uh, the migration uh, crisis. And here we are, uh, the first uh, report uh, of the new commission, which is not called a progress report, but a country report, prepared not by the DG enlargement, by DG near, and the unanswered questions in the air, is this more political commission producing more political report about enlargement? Or not? Um, what is your perspective on this one, <laughs> Igor and Dijmer? You mean the last, last point you made? <laughs> yes, <laughs> in particular. Well, I, I wish Johannes Hahn were here to respond to that one. <laughs> In the, due to his absence, probably we'll have to share a couple of views uh, on, 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 on that. But first of all, I have to say I'm, I'm quite glad uh, for the opportunity to take part in uh, at least part of uh, the Prague European Summit uh, and Forum. It's really great, great uh, to be here. And also, uh, I have to say that the Czech Presidency of the We4 has done a really great job in organizing uh, uh, this annual meeting between Visegrad 4 and Western Balkan six countries and uh, also uh, in an expanded format uh, attended by a few more participants which uh, I think uh, generally uh, 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 supplied the discussion in, in, in very, very, concrete, very concrete terms. Uh, for us, uh, coming from the Western Balkans, uh, I have to say that uh, and, I, and I really believe I speak on behalf of, of everyone. Ditmir can, can uh, give his views on that. But generally speaking, I think we, we're talking about uh, a role model for us. Uh, Visegrad 4 in terms of the regional cooperation, but also the experience that Visegrad 4 member states had to undergo on their way towards Europe. Uh, and the membership into the European Union and, and the NATO was something that is particularly, I think, cherished by, by uh, us in Montenegro. And I'm quite sure that uh, other countries in the Western Balkans more or less see the, see the same way. And uh, definitely possibilities to interact, possibilities to transfer knowledge, expertise, ideas. Like, for example, today we had the signatory ceremony of the Western Balkans Fund, which uh, looks at the experience of the international Visegrad, uh, Visegrad Fund. It's, it's all important because, uh, because we, we, need to, we need to figure out uh, all the mechanisms we need to develop in order to accelerate our European perspective. And this brings me to, to the point uh, uh, Stefan uh, made on, on, on the current enlargement process. Of course, it was with uh, a certain level of concerns. We, we watched uh, the, the, the new uh, setting or the new lineup of, uh, not in personal terms, in terms of the structure of the European Commission. 
uh, all of a sudden enlargement uh, general directorate was replaced with DG near I mean DG neighborhood with uh, with uh, also uh, responsibility to handle enlargement talks but obviously changing the name and sending the message uh, for the next you know five years this already famous message of President Juncker for the next five years in, in under the uh, um, um, under the, 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 the current uh, commission uh, we expect no newcomers to the uh, to, 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 the member state, to, to, the, to the membership of the European Union, which I have to say, uh, I mean, principally speaking, is, is fair enough. I think nobody expected that under the current commission for the next, well, three more years, somebody would qualify to, to join EU because there's still a lot of work ahead. Uh, we've been issued uh, progress reports or whatever country reports uh, this year done under the new methodology Generally speaking, I think we are pleased in Montenegro with what we have the possibility to read. Uh, Montenegro is more or less moderately prepared uh, 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 for the membership in most of, of, the, of, the, of the areas. There's still a lot to be done in, in, in a number of uh, different fields. Also, we need to take proper care with regards to fundamentals, rule of law, economic governance, reform of the public administration. And one, I think, has to be fair and say that, uh, at least in our view is such, that new methodolo methodology probably sheds additional light in terms of the overall preparedness of a country, in terms that you have uh, 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 the, the rate of general preparedness and you also watch carefully what, what is it we've been doing in the past year. Probably there's more fine-tuning needed next year and then year after the next year and so on, but in, in our view, it is, it, is, uh, it is a step into the right, right direction. But, uh, but still, uh, still uh, 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 enlargement fatigue is, uh, at least talk about enlargement fatigue is, is all around. And, you know, reorganizing the economic, uh, reorganizing the European Commission, giving it another name, dealing with this, dealing with that in a different way. And then even, even, even uh, you know, delaying the, the, the reveal of, of, of uh, or the release of the progress report also fueled up certain speculations about what was really going on uh, behind the scene. Um, so the truth is uh, uh, we, we, we still have no proofs that uh, enlargement at some point will stop. Uh, but, you know, it's also quite discouraging to hear um, a growing number of voices that argue that Western Balkan countries should join a package and then join the European Union at some later point. Uh, that's quite discouraging if, if, you, if, if it, I mean, if, as far as we are concerned, because we, we're moving forward. We have already opened 20 chapters. Two have been provisionally closed. Two more to come, hopefully, in December. More to come next year. So there's already a pretty living process of, of accession talks to the European Union. And we still argue that if everything goes well, if we pass the next year's test on rule of law, interim benchmarks, as I hope we will, then the European Commission uh, will, will start you know, uh, uh, working on closing benchmarks in that field, but in other fields as well. Uh, it's 2016 next year. So go going back to other countries' experience, it's reasonable to expect that three more years it takes uh, to complete accession talks, then ratification of a, of a European agreement, and so on and so on. If we stick to this principle of uh, every country should be judged by its own merits, then in the next uh, five, six, seven years, uh, it is reasonable to expect that Montenegro can uh, handle accession talks and accession talks and join, join the European Union, which, again, to be, uh, uh, I mean, frankly speaking, it is not something that all of the other uh, countries from the Western Balkans can, can help for. So if we start or restart talking about you know, doing a bigger package and so on and so on, what, then what does it mean? What, what, if we, I mean, what is it we're talking about? Then, then it really loses, loses its, its, its meaning. At the same time, it is also fair to say that uh, it is on the countries in the region to figure out uh, mechanisms to accelerate European uh, road. Um, to make sure that uh, we are also, I think, morally eligible uh, for, the, for, the, for the European Union in terms of the values we share, commitments we make, 
Uh, so it's not only it shouldn't be only seen as a technocratic process of you know taking off uh, we oh, okay we've done this we've passed this law we've passed this secondary legislation this and that no it it also has to be about you know developing new new set of, of values uh, and sharing it with with, with the others uh, which is uh, uh, transform really transforming the country of uh, uh, being able to cherish uh, well, all the uh, the culture of living by the rules of the rule of law. Uh, if, if, if you get what I if you see what, what, what I'd like to say, also more entrepreneurial spirit and so on and so on. That's really what makes a country different, and that's what I believe transition is is all about. Uh, last year or this year, we are marking 25 years since the beginning of the transition process. Uh, have we lost the purpose of the transition? Uh, uh, or we need to go back and restore some values we were quite enthusiastic in talking about 25 years ago. Uh, and it's obviously difficult a topic when you know that you know, migrants are coming, refugees are coming, that uh, Schengen is, is put under test, uh, Schengen rules are put under test, this and that. And, and although uh, the whole migration crisis may be a temptation for many to actually increase, to make it even more vocal, to increase their voice in, in arguing that EU should not be ready for the next enlargement wave for more years to come. Actually, paradoxically, I think it should inspire all of us to actually work into acceleration of, of the European, uh, 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 of, of the enlargement, of the enlargement uh, process. Maybe I should stop here and then go back to some of the, uh, the, the points later on. We will. Detmir? Thank you. Thank you, Stefan, Thanks. for organizing this panel and uh, I would uh, fully subscribe to the comments made by my colleague concerning the role of the V4 and the support for the Western Balkans. And this has been seen from uh, our perspective as a, as a role model in today's signing of the Western Balkan Fund. Uh, I hope it will serve to this purpose. Um, concerning your um, questions, I would like to add also a few other elements which hopefully uh, might help me also in, in responding to, to, to the question. Um, it's true, this year for the first time we are confronted with the country report. We have been used with country reports by World Bank, IMF and uh, other organizations. Now we have also country report from uh, European Commission. Um, it's also true that this is the first uh, progress report as a, or country report is a product by uh, Digineer, so by the new, uh, new, new commission. And it is also for the first time that we are confronted with enlargement strategy that it's not going to be a yearly exercise anymore, but it sets out basically priorities and also uh, the philosophy of the Juncker commission. Uh, so on one hand, we have seen in the course of the years that the process has become much more intergovernmental than it used to be when V4, for instance, joined the club. And on the other hand, uh, we see that the work of Commission and the interaction between Commission and Member States and Commission and uh, aspiring countries uh, has become more bureaucratic. Um, and this, unfortunately, it's clearly evident also on these country report and the enlargement strategy that is attaching the, that is attaching the, the, the process. Uh, so, to answer you directly, uh, although Johannes San is not here and uh, there is no representative from Digineer, my view is that uh, the country report compared to the previous uh, progress reports, it's more technical. It's less political, but what worries me is the, uh, the paragraphs on the enlargement strategy where in bold language we are being told that in the next five years there won't be any enlargement. I fully agree with Igor in, in terms of uh, preparation level. We are not there and we won't be there in five years' time. But uh, what worries me is the introduction of a political timeline in the enlargement process. So if in the case of Romania and Bulgaria we had this post-verification mechanism, now 
we are having an early <laughs> warning mechanism, if I, if, I may, if I may call it so. This is, this is, um, uh, this is a point for, uh, for reflection. Uh, we have discussed today at length about uh, the impact of refugee crisis in Europe. Um, there has been a prevailing view, not to, say, not to call it a consensus, that this cannot be mixed with uh, enlargement policy and the enlargement process. And, but we all agree that this refugee crisis had also some security implication for not only for the security architecture of Europe or European Union, but also for, uh, for our region, leaving apart humanitarian and financial consequences. And this crisis told us that uh, the level of interaction and the interdependence between EU and Western Balkans is there and it's key. Um, so my plea is for a more geopolitical stance from EU that would allow European Commission to engage with uh, uh, aspiring countries and member states based on a labor division in a more creative way, creative ways which have allowed actually Montenegro, Serbia, Albania and to a lesser degree other countries to be at the stage we are right now. And if I may say something about uh, uh, the, the findings of the, of, the, uh, of the country report, it's, uh, it's a perplexed taste. Igor was mentioning, referring to Montenegro, which has opened 20 chapters so far, that in all areas uh, Montenegro is assessed as moderately uh, prepared for membership. The same holds true for, for Albania. We have no, we have, we have, we haven't opened any chapter. We are not yet provided with uh, a recommendation opening accession talks. And then this, this would be, this would be conveyed with some, with some mixed feelings and mixed uh, messages, and in some cases even with misunderstandings. So, um, I believe also this uh, comparison table. It would be very good if it will instigate more regional cooperation and more transfer of know-how on those, on those areas where uh, we jointly or separately have to uh, fulfill the required standards. Thank you very much, uh, Dutmere. And I, I agree with both of you saying that uh, this uh, more important political dimension enlargement should not mean more of the political engineering and, and, and creating sort of some kind of calendar and abandoning uh, uh, this uh, uh, based on its merit approach. Uh, um, and here I'm trying to help now the audience uh, uh, to focus uh, uh, on the important uh, questions uh, here uh, by saying that I myself uh, uh, am asking the questions uh, uh, 12 years after Thessaloniki uh, has uh, the whole region crossed the line of no return when it comes to the enlargement process. And when I think about uh, what needs to be done uh, uh, to re-energize uh, the enlargement, uh, I mean, I would probably come with a six uh, uh, points. So first, the European Commission needs to be the driving force uh, here and should be immune from sort of uh, any enlargement uh, uh, fatigue and, uh, and defender of the EU policies here and to a certain extent the interest uh, of the candidate and aspirant countries. Second, the regional cooperation uh, was not there five years ago uh, uh, and uh, we had some kind of experience, three of us actually uh, uh, putting it together uh, uh, three years uh, uh, ago. Now the regional cooperation is extremely promising uh, uh, new dimension uh, uh, to strengthen the enlargement. Uh, Point number three, there should not be any moving targets of whether introduced by the Commission or by any member states or group of the member states. Uh, point uh, number four, and this is 
extremely important things which should not be ignored by any report, whether it's called progress report or country report, and it is that the enlargement is not taking place in the vacuum. I mean, look at the Europe. Look at the South, look at the East. Um, and then, after this reflection, sort of come back to the Western Balkans and, 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 and think again whether we have the right uh, uh, policies and right, uh, and right instrument. Um, and point uh, number five, uh, which I also believe is, is important, you could, and actually probably should, uh, uh, put a more clarity on what's being required, uh, what some sometimes seems actually of, of uh, uh, putting the bar uh, too high, but only if it's accompanied with the new ways, new instruments of engagement and helping the countries, uh, you know, to reach that bar. I mean, there needs to be a balance. And the point number six, which probably is getting more and more important, keep the attractiveness of the European Union high. Uh, because that's going to determine uh, whether those will be the last uh, uh, candidate and aspirant countries knocking on our door or not. Uh, and when, but there is no one behind that door knocking. I mean, I would say something's wrong with our organization. So now to the audience. Um, as I said, we just came from uh, uh, the meeting uh, between the V4 and Western Balkan 6. For the first time, uh, actually, a uh, meeting of uh, the countries representing the two regional uh, uh, arrangements or frameworks. And for the first time in the history of these meetings, and there were many, uh, this time we have focused, in addition to enlargement, also to migration. So uh, we're ready to address any questions you might have uh, to those talks uh, uh, which started here yesterday during dinner and continue today in the Chernian Palace or any of the issues we have discussed so far. So, Sultan, very nice to see you. Uh, well, please <coughs> kick off the Q&A. Stefan, thank you very much. My name is Zoltan Martinus. I deal with uh, enlargement, amongst other topics, in the Council Secretariat of the European Union uh, in Brussels. And my question to the two ministers is related to a, uh, a very negative tendency of, uh, of uh, worsening brand names. Um, the Western Balkans uh, is now actually not a positive brand name uh, in Brussels. Only the bad news make it to Brussels. Um, I deal a lot more with enlargement related issues uh, 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 and, uh, and than the general average in Brussels, but I, I myself see that it's, with perhaps the exception of the breakthrough in the Pristina Belgrade negotiations, it is only bad news that make it to Brussels and the brand name of, of the Western Balkans is worsening. And at the other side of the coin, I guess the impression is that the brand name of the European Union in the Western Balkans countries and the Western Balkans publics is fading quite quickly. Um, how do you see any possibility of breaking out of this, this vicious circle? Thank you. Should we, could we have the three questions? Uh, uh, yeah. Igor and Dittmer. Uh, there is a uh, lady there on the right, on my right. Yes, thank you very much. My name is Johanna Daimel, Southeast Europe Association in Munich. I can pick up to what Scholten said. The brand name of the Western Balkans, yes, it's worsening. And uh, there's a two-track. On the one side, we have some sort of successes with the negotiations, as the minister said. But on the other side, we see a tremendously worsening situation on the ground. So the freedom of, of media is deteriorating all across the Balkans. Rule of law. Uh, you in Podgorica, for instance, you have now the protests in front of, uh, of the parliament. Uh, the same applies for Macedonia, which is also in a very, very, very bad shape. So why should the Western Balkans become 
a member of the European Union in a positive sense, so that the enlargement fatigue will decline and we really see the need and see that there is enough effort done that you really meet the requirements on basics. What we see is a deterioration despite uh, enhancing negotiations. Thank you. Thank you for this one. And one more, the gentleman here in the third row. Hi, good afternoon. Um, my name is Andrew Repman. I'm a reporter with EU Observer in Brussels. Um, we've, we've heard some dire warnings about the um, coherence of the European project if, if the migrant crisis is mishandled. But of course, uh, your region uh, has known serious instability not, not so long ago, 20 years ago. Uh, we've, we've heard from the other questioners that uh, the situation with some of the governments is, is becoming increasingly fragile. So my question is, could these this mass uh, arrivals of, of, of people through the Western Balkans, if, if it's not handled well, could it reignite instability in the Western Balkan region? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, we have heard three questions, first and second, actually very much related. Uh, uh, would like to start? Uh, well, well, thank you for, for the questions. Um, well, uh, an option uh, for this uh, branding problem is to change the brand. So maybe we should uh, skip talking about Western Balkans, try to, to, to apply some another name. <laughs> Adriatic Europe, for instance. Uh, Eastern Adriatic, Adriatic or Eastern Europe. Adriatic Ionian, something like that, which may sound more, more, uh, more uh, bluer. <laughs> no, but, uh, you know, uh, currently, uh, it's, I think, quite similar in, in other Western Balkan countries, but at least uh, if uh, uh, I know the figures from Montenegro, there is still two-thirds of the population which favor Montenegrins uh, bid for the membership into the EU, um, as opposed to probably 30% of the population in the average European uh, uh, member state towards new enlargement. Uh, it might be because of uh, the situation in Western Balkan countries. But, you know, you mentioned protests. Does it mean that in other EU, EU countries there are no protests in front of the parliament? Some recent uh, coverage, press coverage from Brussels was a lot more violent than what we saw in Podgorica. A lot more violent in terms of the, the, uh, the way how police handled it. Uh, and also, I mean, we're seeing protests every day taking place against austerity. We've seen uh, Pegida protests in Germany and, and many other countries. Even some relatively violent ones uh, against migrants. I think it is the whole atmosphere uh, which is not very good currently. And, uh, uh, and, I th uh, 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 and I think the part of the problem is also with the fact that uh, if uh, EU is not able to provide real answers to uh, migrants' crisis, to uh, I mean, structural problems, uh, uh, euro crisis, and so on, sustainable solutions, then, uh, listen, I wouldn't be surprised to see that, for example, support for NATO integration grows in Montenegro and, and EU support drops. That, that, that's quite reasonable to expect that. Uh, so I think we need to see this as a two-way street and I think we need both to work out uh, uh, some uh, mechanisms of, uh, of course, uh, uh, in my introductory points I made it very clear that, that I believe uh, Western Balkan countries should do more in, in not only, you know, taking off uh, different items on the agenda but also making sure that we are morally credible to become member states of the European Union in terms of the values we share, not only verbally but, I mean, in practice. Um, but I, I also think that we must not be left to our own devices. I think it's also the role of the European Union, uh, member states, but also European Commission, that's their job, to make sure that this process is a living one. And when you look at different uh, EU policies, 
let, let's be let's be fair, but some are in real, I mean, in tatters compared to to enlargement policy, which has been one of the most effective ones of the decades. Uh, so why should we give up uh, one of the most uh, successful poli EU policies? Uh, I don't think it's it's right approach uh, to to uh, uh, not only bringing us into the membership, but actually to make sure that European Union is able to understand its today's role. And I think it's changing. European Union after the F Second World War was a, was a peace project, obviously. Uh, as of the 1990s, it started to be more of a unification project. Now, despite this enlargement policy, but EU, uh, uh, I think, has uh, the, the role of trying to identify itself, uh, uh, is, uh, should also look at itself from the global competitiveness point of view. And uh, in order to make sure that European Union is able to uh, come out of this whole a set of challenges as a stronger union, not necessarily ever closer, we, we discussed that today, but as a stronger union, really stronger union, then it has to understand that there's a lot more to be done also in terms of sustainability, productivity, competitiveness, and so on and so on. And I really believe Western Balkan countries can, can, can help, uh, although we are small markets, uh, not taken separately, but even together. But it matters, I think, uh, from, from uh, uh, the, the quality of, of EU's, EU's uh, general quality of EU's DNA. Uh, but of course, we, we, there's a lot that we can do on our side, and uh, today's signing of uh, the Western Balkans Fund and, uh, uh, is, is, I think, a major step forward in, in enhancing project-oriented uh, regional cooperation. Uh, last night we were presented with some of the ideas that look at boosting trade, with cutting red tape in the region, also look at how to uh, really make sure that, uh, that connectivity projects materialize. We need to speak with one voice on different subjects, different matters. Uh, there has to be less bickering sometimes, and more proactive uh, consultations and so on and so on, in order really to make sure that we speak as one and act as one, one region. So there are still some uh, less visible walls we need to tear down. And that's, that's our responsibility. But if we are left uh, to our own devices, I think uh, EU will, will just make a grave mistake. Can you focus now both of you on, those, uh, uh, on that question related to migration? Uh, yes. Well, oh, did move did me on. I, I can add up. Just one very minor comment about the, 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 the brand. Um, uh, this is not something new for the EU. I mean, I would recall here the statements made by Helmut Schmidt in the case of the accession of uh, Spain and Portugal, when he was saying that neither Spain nor Portugal, or it's not in their interest to join EU. He put it in a very gentle way, actually. Also, François Mitterrand in the case of Bulgaria and, and Romania, when he was saying that basically they would never join uh, the club. In way or another, reflecting the mood within EU about those countries. And we see nowadays more or less uh, the, 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 the same mood. I, I don't think that it's a question of, it's a question of uh, only the brand name, but it's, it reflects more the mood about enlargement, which is, which is, not, which is not in favor in, 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 in few EU member states. And this is not a novelty because the whole enlargement project has been carried out with not that much popular, popular support. If we speak about brand names, let's not forget that it was due to European project that enemies in our region has been transformed into neighbors. It is not that enemies or bad guys were transformed within a night into good guys. And I would not agree with the statement that with the exception of the breakthrough in uh, uh, Serbia-Kosovo talks, nothing has changed in, in our region. Especially within the previous term, the previous commission term, there has been many 
many developments, although the political environment about the enlargement process was not very supportive. We've got Serbia uh, candidacy, and now they sitting in the accession table in a few days, hopefully. Uh, you've got Montenegro uh, sitting in the accession table, Albania being granted candidate status, uh, the, the SAA developments in the case of uh, Bosnia, and nowadays the entry into force of uh, the SAA, and the launching process of the SAA and visa liberalization process for Kosovo. And nowadays, at least, there is a network of SAAs with all countries in the region. And I believe we are at the last miles when it comes to the visa-free regime. Uh, this is one, one comment. The second one, uh, we can call it Adriatic Europe. We are more than happy to call it Adriatic Europe because for the sake of truth, it's not the question of Western Balkans. It's the question that of Balkans that policymakers and ordinary citizens especially do associate it with wars, with conflicts and with tensions. Now even with financial crisis and with other related elements. So whether it's Western or Eastern Balkans, it seems that uh, people do have a problem with, uh, with, with that name. But let's not forget Croatia was part of Western Balkans and they still they still uh, sometimes also uh, would like to call themselves as part of Western Balkans and now they are part uh, they are part of the club so the point is that we expect also that this year there will be good news for 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 Montenegro as far as NATO accession is is concerned but the point is whether these process could be re-energized, as, as, as Stefan was, was mentioning. And here we need also other actors, other actors on board. Uh, concerning the uh, refugee crisis, uh, I would like to make only one comment about the refugee crisis as far as Western Balkans are, are, are concerned. First, we have seen responsible attitude and actions by, by governments in, in our region in handling with the crisis. And second, uh, I think one should look also at the security dimensions or security angles of this crisis, especially the potential of infiltration of the so-called foreign fighters in these, uh, in these refugee, uh, refugee stream. Because this could uh, add up a little bit tensions and also uh, negative stereotypes that are uh, quite persistent in Europe nowadays, also for, 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 for our region. And thirdly, as I mentioned at the very outset, the current refugee crisis showed once again the importance of interaction between European Union and Western Balkans. Because we are being served as a gate for Middle East and, 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 and Mediterranean. Okay, and uh, now let's now make it a little bit more interactive and I'm trying to keep both the questions and answer uh, shorter. Uh, Igor, uh, feel free I mean, to add anything uh, on this migration-related questions, but can I ask you something as a follow-up to the question on, on deterioration of the situation? How do you see it? Is this deterioration, uh, the lady has referred, a reflection of the lack of the progress and enlargement, or it is exactly the other way around? Or do we face here a different uh, issue? And it is that uh, actually the region is not that bad in drafting the laws, establishing the institution, but when it comes to the implementation, when it comes to the independence of those institutions, it's a long way, really, to deliver on it. What's your take, Igor? Your country experience, well, short. I mean, I think our country's experience is, 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 is positive, I mean, overall, because uh, next year it will be 10 years of independence. In 10 years of independence, we uh, will hopefully have been already member state of the NATO or in the process of really making it formal and plus deep in the accession talks with the EU compared to, uh, for example, Visegrad 4, it's quite similar. It took nine or ten years for, for some of uh, the Visegrad 4 to join NATO and 15 to join EU. So it sounds quite similar. But 
and the overall trajectory for the region, I believe, is, is, is relatively positive. When we go back only five years ago, and when you look at the situation in all, all the countries, uh, well, uh, for example, Serbia in those years was still bogged down with the problem of uh, uh, non-cooperation with ICTI. The Hague Tribunal, come on, it was only five years ago. Now we're already deep in talks between Belgrade and Pristina about how to normalize relationship. Uh, so a lot has been, I think, achieved. Because this is not, uh, for some of the countries, it has not been a regular process. Uh, if it uh, 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 you know, hadn't been for, for the name problem, uh, Macedonia would have probably been uh, either inside the EU or very close uh, to both uh, uh, EU and uh, already for some years in the NATO. They started the process more or less when Croatia did. So there are some specific problems countries in the region have been fa faced with. And the more um, this specific, specific problem pertains, um, an inability of all the stakeholders to resolve them, uh, the, the, the more complicated enlargement process, and then probably it, it transmits this, this uh, 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 wrong message, and then we have the problem with the branding of our, uh, of, 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 of our region. So I think all need to be, in a way, more proactive in, in solving it. It's, uh, of course, it's easier to say than, than, than to do, but I think that, that's, the, that's, the, that's the bottom line. On, on, on on the side of the EU, I really believe that there can be um, more mechanisms of, of support. Uh, some have started, uh, such as uh, this connectivity agenda, but also followed by soft measures, cutting business barriers, and so on and so on. But I think EU, I see no reason why, for example, EU should not decide to invite at least candidate countries to join more or less all the meetings taking place in, in Brussels. I see no, no reason why not. I mean, we have no voting power, we have no uh, commissioners, we have no uh, uh, directors, uh, the DG directors, and so on and so on. We have no European par parliamentarians, but I see no reason why all the countries should not be attended. There are no particular secrets being, being discussed. And if there are some secrets, okay, fine. We can, we can uh, wait in the next room. But generally speaking, there's, there, there can be more engagement, I think, from, the, from both sides and sometimes more, uh, uh, more, more proactive consultations. And, and, and I'm finishing with this last, last, uh, last uh, sentence on this. Uh, we discussed migration today uh, also. And uh, what happens uh, uh, the, the next day if Germany decides to close their borders? Uh, if p countries on the route would not know that in advance, what happens? They're going to get stuck with tens of thousands of people in the region. Uh, for currently, Albania and Montenegro, we're not that affected. But the next day from that, we can be, because then people will just try to uh, seek for another way how to get to the European Union member state, Italy, for example, across the sea. Or they just, just can try to uh, figure out ways how to stay, stay on in some of, our, some of our countries. And then we are getting a lot more affected, but uh, stuck with, with, a, with a bigger problem, all of, us, all of us together. So that's why we need to engage all of us into more, more uh, uh, active dialogue, I think. To feel belong, Did, yeah, to yeah. feel that we be really belong. Yeah. Just uh, listening to you, when I was at the beginning uh, uh, offering you a uh, couple of those points uh, which uh, I believe would re-energize uh, the enlargement, uh, I should probably add also uh, the one uh, uh, that your countries uh, in the Western Balkan regions avoid sort of uh, providing uh, the European Union member states is really good excuses, uh, uh, actually, to make a progress here. Uh, um, I'm taking this question on the deterioration of the situation in, in certain countries and in certain areas as, as indeed a very serious uh, uh, question. Okay, uh, well, let's have another round. I have a gentleman to my left in the second row. Thank you very much, uh, Stephen Bluckman, Center for European Policy Studies in Brussels. And I would like to uh, latch on immediately to what uh, uh, Mr. Fule has just said, uh, and, and out of my surprise to what, uh, what the Foreign Minister of Montenegro um, just said about Macedonia, um, on, could have been on the brink of entering the European Union. That is certainly not the case. If you read at this stage the country report, there's even a warning that the positive recommendation of the European Commission uh, might be withdrawn over time. My question is not so much on the state of Macedonia now, my question is more about that warning. 
is it wise for the European Commission to withdraw a positive recommendation or not? Thank you very much for your question. Uh, next one. Uh, just okay, we don't have the next one. You Did you do? You have the okay, I have not uh, seen this. Uh, there is a lady. Uh, oh, three, four, five, six row on my left. Uh, hello, my name is Teresa Nivotna. I'm based at the university in Brussels. Um, uh, I've done quite a lot of research on the 2004 enlargement, so maybe I will reflect a little bit on that and have perhaps a little bit theoretical question, although you, you dealt with it uh, quite a lot already. Uh, but one of the current stakes which the Commission had for the 2004 was uh, uh, setting the accession date which worked quite well and, and also playing uh, with the fact how many countries would join at certain moment uh, in the time. Um, now, you can have, um, uh, you can sort of set the accession date a bit too early, which in my view happened with Romania and Bulgaria, and then you sort of end up instead of with deep reforms, uh, with sort of creating Putinkin villages. Uh, or, you can set the accession date too late or not to set the accession date at all, which is what's happening now with the Western Balkans and has been going on with Turkey for quite a while. So I do understand definitely the enlargement fatigue or you know, problems with absorption capacity, all these kind of things. But aren't we as the European Union uh, sort of giving up on one of the main leverages we have over the countries in Western Balkans, how to induce the reforms. So maybe I would be curious to hear also Mr. Fula's view on this, not just the you know, regional ministers who obviously are disappointed with the country reports, but how do you see it also from our EU perspective as one of the means how, how, to, how to exert our leverage? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. One more, please. And there is a, yeah, exactly, the lady in the back. Thank you very much, Jujan Novik, Central European University. Uh, since you mentioned that it was uh, Visegrad and Balkan summit, and you were discussing migration, I wanted to ask whether the V4 countries have offered any concrete support to the Balkan countries uh, to deal with the pressures of the migration, either altogether or individually. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, Dismir, would you like to take this one on Macedonia? There was a the question. How, yes. There was a question whether there it was, was wise actually were, to make the threat to withdraw the recommendation. I don't want to put into question the uh, the assessment of European Commission or the Digineer, but uh, could, the way how the you way could, how <laughs> the way how I read it, uh, the, the the report and the recommendation or the conditioned recommendation. I read it with the, uh, with the daily engagement or intensive engagement of European Commission in helping uh, the representatives of the uh, uh, whole political spectrum in Macedonia to overcome the current political stale stalemate that is, that is going on. So I haven't read this as a, as a withdrawal of uh, European Commission engagement uh, towards uh, towards Macedonia. Then, whether Macedonia would have been in the accession table, uh, what kind of situation we would have seen in Macedonia? This is this is something. Uh, this is a question, a different question. <coughs> and I believe, if Macedonia would have been in the accession table, the democratic credentials in the country would have been higher because of the conditionality being provided by European Commission and by the enlargement package. So I, the way how I read uh, or how I interpret Igor was through, 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 through these lines in the case of Macedonia. And I think this is valid also elsewhere in the region. We have seen a European Commission being engaged in the case of Serbia. It pays off. 
being engaged in the case of Montenegro, it paid off. Being engaged in the case of Albania, it paid off. Being engaged also in the, in the case of, uh, of, um, of, of Kosovo, and it paid off. So the point is whether commission will be solicited on the driving seat in the enlargement process. This is, this is, very, this is very crucial. Uh, the, 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 the second point, uh, it's not that we are disappointed by the country reports. I, 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 I don't think that there are signs of disappointment with the country reports. It's a question of having more political soul in this process and political soul that can be translated into different actions. We didn't mention, we didn't touch upon uh, the so-called Berlin process during this discussion. But as Igor was mentioning, nowadays countries in the region are sitting together and discussing about uh, infrastructure projects. And we have been doing so for the last two years and a half. So now is the point, uh, we have reached the point of no returns in terms of cooperation. But we still need to implement few projects in order to be credible, first of all, and to speak about <coughs> the tomorrow and not the next day after tomorrow. So this is, this is, this is very key also to maintain the attractiveness not only of the European Union, which is quite high, in Western Balkans compared to EU member states, but also to keep the process alive. Yeah. Igor, would you like to address the issue concerning uh, the V4 offer to the Western Balkan countries as far as migration, sort of as uh, assistance? Well, I think, uh, well, yes, we discussed that and uh, we four are, are ready to help, ready to support. Uh, it is a matter of uh, well, discussions what way to support those countries which are most affected, uh, Macedonia, Serbia, uh, basically um, the most, most affected ones. Uh, but um, <clears throat> it is, it is uh, I think it is, it, it, basically it, what matters is that uh, are we really on the same page uh, with regards to how to treat the problem? because we've seen the total collapse of the migration policies of the EU, uh, generally speaking, because it's, it, it, is, it is basically dealt with at national level. Uh, and people have been talking about uh, the, uh, the collapse of uh, Dublin uh, Accord, the uh, collapse of uh, oh, Schengen t has been put to test. I'm reading today that Sweden will introduce border controls uh, to last for the next uh, several days, week or two weeks and so on. So uh, uh, that, that's why I think uh, uh, even, even some more somber uh, uh, anticipations or, or uh, assumptions with regards to more uh, migrants coming uh, from different areas, not only Middle East, but, uh, but uh, even Pakistan, Bangladesh and so on. So there has to be a, a proper and coordinated response to this. Uh, and, and, and that's basically what, what we're talking about here. Uh, Western Balkan countries definitely do not deserve to be uh, to be left to their own devices. Uh, and uh, I mean, when you look at uh, the, the, the the transit route, uh, Macedonia, Serbia, those people, uh, if they want to come to those two countries, uh, they have to you know uh, transit uh, EU member states. So. Uh, it's, it's more than welcome, uh, any type of a support uh, in this field or any, 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 any other field. But I think we need, we, need to, we need to understand what happens the next day if we reach the point, and we will definitely at some point reach that point, uh, that Germany decides to close their borders. There is already a lot of internal pressure to do that. Uh, so what, 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 come ne what comes next? And also to, to make it very clear on, on, the, on the previous question, uh, Factually, just imagine, uh, instead of uh, being sidelined, Macedonia enters NATO 2008. Instead of uh, 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 a suspension, Macedonia starts accession talks in 2009. We have 2015. 
Do you really think that a country which is already a member state of NATO, a very, very deep and, and probably even closing a lot of chapters, could have been in the same position? This doesn't mean that I'm putting blame on anybody, uh, any, any member state for, for this, uh, because also uh, 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 all the political parties in Macedonia should, should be aware of their own responsibility and so on and so on. But let, 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 let's, be, let's, be, let's be frank. And had it been the other way around, it would have been a, of great, uh, uh, it would have been a great boost for every other country in the region. The more countries on the right track, the better for, I think, everyone. And if I may, uh, to add uh, on, uh, on the Prague meeting of the V4 of Western Balkan 6, so on the, on the migration, I see the three sort of uh, 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 important results. First, this was the third such a meeting representing much more active engagement between the EU institutions and the countries of the Western Balkan migration routes. 8th of uh, October, Luxembourg, 25th of October, leadership meeting uh, uh, in, in Brussels and Prague, not necessarily as a direct continuation, but following the framework of this active engagement. I, and I have to say, looking uh, at both the press reports and the results of the meeting, I see actually uh, the member states sort of coming uh, back to one one could uh, refer as a, as a mainstream uh, here uh, but we are not there uh, but all of us there I mean you have heard the Hungarian <coughs> foreign minister here yesterday the second uh, important result of that meeting was that there was a clear promise to continue and accelerate uh, actually our support uh, uh, for the countries of the Western Balkan uh, migration routes within the European Union and also outside of the European Union. And point number three, uh, the V Forum has called uh, on an urgent basis to create the network of coordinators uh, and has asked uh, uh, the Western Balkans uh, to do the same to ensure that the assistance the V4 is going to continue to, to offer is sustainable, effective and well targeted. Now, on Macedonia, if I may uh, add, uh, I see a clear link between Macedon Macedonia being uh, uh, left in front of the closed door for too long and the domestic uh, crisis and that uh, 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 glue which was putting together this multi-ethnic uh, country actually not working uh, anymore and that glue being actually indeed the uh, uh, aspirations to join uh, both the European Union and, uh, uh, and, and uh, uh, NATO. The eventuality of withdrawing the recommendation has never been primarily a threat or ultimatum but rather the sad reflection of the state of affairs uh, in, uh, uh, in, that particular, in that particular country. Uh, and the last point on Macedonia, uh, I'm happy to see that after yet another domestic crisis, there is yet another sort of solution, which I'm afraid will not bring yet again a uh, uh, lasting solution unless we address the name issue and unless we sort of move forward uh, uh, along the uh, enlargement uh, along the enlargement process so, uh, and I'm the one uh, on the last point who always believed in this merit-based uh, approach uh, um, I've always uh, uh, rejected uh, any speculation concerning the date calendars uh, and so on, um, uh, particularly at this, uh, at that stage of, uh, uh, of uh, enlargement, uh, I think it would be dangerous uh, to accelerate someone at the expense of the quality of the work and to delay someone uh, just uh, uh, for him to wait uh, um, uh, for the others. Okay, uh, we have the question.
question there. Wait, behold, your hand on unless I see. I see the gentleman at the end. Uh, then you're, then you let, okay, you have the microphone just there, yeah. Okay, Thank you very let's much. start. Thank you very much for the second opportunity, which I would like to use as we have the Minister of Foreign Affairs from Albania, uh, Dithmir Bujati. Uh, Albania is not yet a transit country for the migrants, could be, but it is a, a country of origin of migration. So what do you do in your country with those who are readmitted from, from Germany, the process is starting, and to prevent your comrades to leave your country? I cannot help myself to say a good, good question. Uh, there is a man in the back. Yes, please. Uh, good evening, uh, Gin Samuel in Latvian Public Radio. Uh, since we talk about uh, Euro integration and enlargement, I would like to ask a short question about another kind of enlargement, Euro-Atlantic enlargement, and uh, possibility that Montenegro will be uh, invited to join in December. Uh, so uh, my question is to Mr. Luksic, uh, how it looks now? Will you get it? Do you have support? You previously made a comment that uh, that you have some, which I understand you have some doubts about that. And then to Albania, we joined 2009, Czech Republic, do you support Montenegro in December? And the question for all three of you, uh, well, we? Russia won't be happy probably about this. Uh, it will be the first enlargement since uh, annexation of Crimea. I actually uh, tuned into Russian channel recently. I think it was Kisilo's uh, Sunday evening show. And there was a report about uh, uh, protests in Montenegro and it was portrayed as a uh, people protest against NATO. Uh, so do you expect uh, there can be further difficulties in relations with between NATO and Russia. Thank you. Okay, Dmitry, would you start? Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. On the first question, uh, I think we have to make a clear distinction between asylum uh, crisis and migration crisis. Uh, what we like to call it also economic nomadism, which we have experienced in the Balkans, with the uh, rising numbers of uh, unfolded asylum, asylum requests. We've seen last year with the Serbia and Macedonia the same phenomenon uh, this year um, with Albania. Uh, we believe the decision of the German government and also the decision of the European Union to put all uh, Western Balkan countries uh, as countries of, uh, in the list of safe origin is producing the first results. Um, if I refer to the uh, numbers, there is a clear decrease uh, from the peak that was like 8,000 uh, in, in the middle of summer. Uh, nowadays, uh, we, have, we have only 4,000. And very good cooperation, I think it's... Um, it's uh, uh, it's being witnessed between the government of German government and Albanian government and also uh, between uh, police forces. The second dimension is the, uh, the outreach because we have discussed also today at length the incentives of these uh, asylum, asylum seeking procedures for uh, people who are uh, seeking those social benefits and now we have uh, engaged ourselves also in a clear uh, communication campaign, especially in those areas that have been uh, mostly affected by these phenomena. We expect that by the end of the year um, again a decrease and then um, hopefully um, a total eradication of uh, these uh, phenomena. On the question concerning uh, Albania's support for um, accession of Montenegro, yes. Uh, also the country report, the EC country report for Albania <laughs> this year highlights this fact that uh, Albania has continuously uh, supported the accession of uh, Montenegro. I think it's, uh, uh, it's a good sign that all neighboring countries are 
on the other hand, uh, on the other border, let, let's put it in this way, Croatia and uh, Albania, they are both uh, supporting the accession of, uh, of uh, uh, Montenegro into NATO, and I think uh, this would be mutually beneficial for NATO because it would complete, let's say, its presence from Lisboa to, uh, to, to Istanbul, and everyone and everybody and all uh, concerned parties will be uh, part of this uh, map, but also for, for Montenegro because hopefully it will provide more democratic stability and prosperity, not only for the Montenegrin society, but also for, um, for the region. Concerning Russia, um, this is maybe also another element that uh, we need to uh, discuss a little bit further. Um, we see an increased uh, interest of uh, uh, or activation of uh, Russia in, in, in our region and this is not only in terms of statements coming from Russian Foreign Ministry uh, for the events in, in our region but also through uh, other, other, other means in a very verticalized way and I wouldn't be surprised that uh, they would a a react also about uh, uh, the possible accession of uh, Montenegro NATO. Thank you. Thanks, Igor. Well, briefly, uh, 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 I believe the prospects are good. I think we, we are reasonable, reasonably optimist ahead of uh, the, the ministerial, but of course it is up to the member states to make the decision because it has to be drawn by consensus. And uh, on us, uh, it, it's been to, uh, to uh, deliver, and I think we've done what we were expected to do last year in Cardiff. Uh, at, uh, when, when, when decision was, was made in, in, in Wales to open intensify and focus talks. Uh, even, even last year, decision I mean, could have been could have been made, but to be fair enough, I think today Montenegro is even better prepared, or, or, or it is better prepared than it was a year ago. Uh, it's true that um, uh, relatively recently we had uh, protests uh, in, in Montenegro. We believe that uh, one of the motives was to actually uh, solidify anti-NATO camp in, in Montenegro. I don't want to say that all those people who, who gathered uh, belong to anti-NATO uh, uh, camp or, or and, uh, uh, NATO opponents, but I think the, the whole screenplay, uh, the, uh, the, the, the messages, uh, uh, you know, the timing, uh, I think assures uh, assure anyone that the, 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 you know, the preventing NATO invitation was somewhere as an ulterior motive. Uh, I mean, um, uh, what, the, the simple question may go, okay, uh, if, if you're really interested for democratization of the society or, or the country and so on and so on, okay, so why don't you organize uh, the, the, all those political events after the invitation? Uh, the, the, that, that can make sense, but this doesn't make sense. So that's why we believe uh, one of the motives, strong motives, was, was to, to, to try to destabilize the country ahead of the NATO invitation. 40 years after the Helsinki final act has been signed, uh, it's not true that we do not have uh, Helsinki final act anymore. Uh, uh, the spirit has been broken uh, uh, in Crimea and the eastern Ukraine. Um, I believe that uh, the principles like that every European, every independent European country has its sovereign right to choose about uh, its future is still there. There is no space for this sort of zero-sum approach to the European security. Uh, we have witnessed uh, uh, the attempt uh, uh, to refer to this approach when the countries of the Central Europe were joining the uh, uh, North Atlantic Treaty organizations. Uh, uh, and uh, we have seen uh, only the normalization rather than worsening of uh, the relationship between those countries and, uh, uh, and, and Russia. So good luck, uh, uh, Igor. Um, I think we have probably time for the last uh, one or two questions, if there is an appetite uh, uh, in an audience, which I understand is uh, Friday afternoon, 13. 
rather tired. Uh, uh, to close unless, the I, <laughs> unless I don't see any hand uh, up, and before uh, some of you is going to join us, uh, can I nevertheless try to end up on a more positive tone? First, Croatia joining. Second, starting the accession negotiation with Montenegro with Serbia. Third, Albanian candid candidate uh, status. Fourth, Kosovo coming to the mainstream of enlargement. All of that happening in the last two, three years. Huh? Five, Bosnia-Herzegovina, uh, uh, SAA entering into the force. Uh, and now we're talking about uh, uh, the timing of what we call the credible application to join the European Union. Six, regional cooperation, which is a magnificent uh, uh, success of all your countries. Seven, visa-free regime uh, for almost all countries of the Western Balkans. Eight, credibility of the enlargement process being back with uh, uh, the new streamlined way to prepare the candidates, not for the EU yesterday, but for the European Union today and the future. Ladies and gentlemen, there is a solid base to work on it. So let's not lose hope. Uh, let's not take that hope from us by anyone uh, else. Uh, I wish you and uh, uh, us uh, uh, that we are able to build on, uh, on that uh, and, uh, and not getting lost in those uh, increasing challenges to the European Union. Now with that, if I may uh, invite you, you to join us uh, and to say a couple of words uh, at the end uh, of uh, the Prague European Summit. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Fula. Uh, I had the privilege, uh, together with my colleagues, to open uh, Prague European Summit yesterday. And I have now the same privilege uh, uh, to conclude it. I, yes. Commissioner Fula said, uh, it's Friday afternoon, the evening. Uh, you are tired, I am tired, so I uh, won't speak uh, for too long. Uh, just a few remarks. Um, this conference uh, was from the beginning uh, meant as a, as a pilot project, uh, as a beginning of uh, something all the partners which stand behind the organization hopes will be a, a very long, long-term project. Uh, so conference, uh, we called it pilot conference at the beginning or in the framework of uh, the Prague European Summit. What was the ambition uh, of this year conference? Uh, uh, it was start the process of uh, debating uh, the strategic uh, questions of European integration uh, in the Czech Republic, and, but not in the Czech context, in the, in the European context. To answer uh, many of the questions uh, we uh, put in the agenda, uh, and I think here we, here we succeeded. Uh, to send a message uh, to our partners uh, in Western Balkans, in Eastern Europe, in Southern neighborhood, that uh, we are thinking of them, uh, that we are taking their uh, uh, worries and their uh, thinking in uh, consideration. Uh, but also uh, to send message to ourselves uh, that uh, we stick to our values, uh, that all the crisis uh, that Europe has gone through has tested our, our values, uh, but at the end, from all the crises that Europe went through, went through stronger and more united uh, than ever before. And I truly hope uh, this will be uh, the case also of the current refugee crisis. And uh, our ambition was also to put Prague back on the map of the policymaking in uh, Europe, not just the conference map, but the maps where the, uh, where the visions and, um, and strategies are are designed and I hope uh, we at least uh, partially succeeded also in this way. Uh, one of the esteemed members of the International Programme Council said that uh, accepted our invitation uh, because her impression was that uh, the Union is like a donut and uh, the Central Europe, it's like a, a hole in that donut. 
And I hope that we proved uh, that we were able to, uh, to fill in this hole at least a bit. And um, that in uh, years to come, uh, we will work hard. And to promise you that in years uh, to come, we will uh, work hard uh, to continue in this process. We heard different opinions uh, from different speakers, uh, sometimes very, very diverging from our ministers. We heard that we have to stick to the rules thoroughly. And then from the think tankers, uh, we heard that uh, during the crisis, you sometimes have to uh, break the rules. And those who are breaking the rules, uh, they will be awarded by the, uh, by the future. Uh, we also um, uh, heard uh, that despite uh, what we were able to achieve during the last 60, more than 60 years of uh, the project of European integration, that we should be really proud of that. Uh, but we are not. Uh, we are, uh, despite all the misunderstandings, despite all the quarrels uh, we might have, we have achieved probably still the best times uh, of the history of the European continent. Uh, and we are uh, not being proud of it, and we, uh, and we should. Uh, probably we have some kind of uh, problem in the self-confidence uh, uh, of being proud of ourselves. And now, the ambition for the upcoming years. Uh, of course, Prague European Summit will continue. Uh, please take this as a very specific, concrete invitation for the next year, June, between 6th and 8th, uh, which uh, will be the date when uh, the first regular Prague European Summit, with the presence of um, uh, prime ministers of uh, Central European countries, the Visegrad countries and the Benel countries, will uh, take place. I hope um, that Prague European Summit will become a regular uh, forum uh, written in your agendas well ahead and um, uh, you, will, you will be able uh, to uh, come again. The ambition uh, for the next year uh, and, uh, is, is to debate uh, one crucial question, uh, how it was defined by the International uh, Programme Council or Programme Board and it's better together with the question mark. So there is a reference to the pro-EU campaign in, in the UK. And uh, I'm sure that under this uh, uh, reference we can, uh, we can uh, hide a majority of the one a pressing issues uh, the Europe will be facing uh, in June next year. But not only that, but also be able to look a bit behind, uh, behind just the current crisis, and to be able uh, to discuss uh, the strategic issues of uh, European future. So, I promise you to be short. I am heading towards the end. Uh, now, the last part uh, is the most beloved obligation to me to thank all of you, especially uh, to the three think tanks, uh, Institute of International Relations, Think Tank European Values, and uh, my uh, think tank, uh, European Institute for European Policy, to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, of course, to the International Visegrad Fund, to all the speakers, uh, to all the participants, especially those of you who <laughs> were able uh, to stay with us until the end, to journalists who serve as a very important uh, transmitter uh, of the messages uh, and the, the, the ideas uh, which were uh, debated uh, today. And especially uh, special thanks to the members of the program, International Program Council uh, of the International Program Council of the uh, Summit. Uh, for the RDA's inputs, but also very constructive criticism towards all the shortcomings of this uh, first year pilot project. Uh, then to the European Commission representation uh, to Prague for the uh, cooperation and uh, for the uh, help 
uh, not during the preparatory phases, but also here on the spot. And then, of course, to all the individuals uh, from all the partner organizations who uh, put such a lot of energy uh, and make uh, this forum uh, possible. That's it. Uh, Last bon appetit. And the two foreign ministers, and the two ministers <laughs> of course. <laughs> And now, please uh, um, accept our invitation for a small cocktail at the usual place over there. Thank you very much. Good luck. <laughs>